Is it recording? I don't see the indication. Okay. We're live. Welcome, everybody, uh, to the cyber.org webinar series. Uh, today, we're going to talk about creating inclusive environments in cyber education. Uh, of course, today's date is the 18th, but that's really irrelevant. Once we share this to YouTube, you can view this at any time. So thanks, and we're happy you're joining us. Uh, we do have a live audience in attendance, and we've asked them to type some questions in the chat. Uh, we've got three panelists we're going to talk to today, and we're going to save some time at the end to address some of those questions. Uh, and if anything comes up in the middle, we'll be sure to uh, to pause and, and address that too. So um, thanks for joining us. We hope you get some interesting information. Um, the panelists include today um, Dr. Brianna Blazer from the University of Washington, uh, Ms. Tish Harris from uh, Department for Blind and Vision Impaired in Richmond, Virginia, and Mr. James Hall out of the Wilson Workforce Rehabilitation Center, also in Virginia. Uh, my name is Dr. Chuck Gardner. I'm the Director of Curriculum for Cyber.org, and we're just going to start with a real brief overview of Cyber.org and the services and, and the opportunities uh, that we provide and support teachers with across the state, uh, across the country, and then we're going to get to our panelists. Uh, so for those of you who don't know, uh, the Cyber Innovation Center is the parent organization for Cyber.org, and we are headquartered in Boger City, Louisiana, with a mission to diversify the region's economic base through the development of a knowledge-based knowledge economy that's focused on solving strategic national security challenges. The way Cyber.org achieves that mission is through the development of classroom curriculum and resources uh, that are available at no cost to teachers across the country uh, through a grant from the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, or CISA. Uh, and we've been operating under the CISA program now for about eight, nine years, and um, hopefully many more continued years of partnership in the future. Uh, we do this through the, uh, like I said, the development of curriculum that we share through our um, Canvas Learning Management System through the Instructure Program, uh, and all of this content is free for all teachers. Uh, you can learn more about all of our content that's available at cyber.org uh, at any time and request free access uh, for you and your colleagues. Get them to sign up. We, we'd love to get more and more teachers uh, engaged with this content. Uh, currently, we have over 21,000 teachers across the country who are using this content from coast to coast. Um, Alaska, Hawaii, uh, three US territories, including Puerto Rico, uh, Guam, and what's the other one? Somebody on the team? Uh, Virgin Islands? Is it Virgin Islands? I can't remember if Guam was, anyway. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah, I, I see Puerto Rico and and uh, and and Guam and the Virgin Islands. So we've got our three territories. Uh, we've got our partnerships, uh, including friends at Palo Alto and Nice and, and Department of Defense and the Girl Scouts. So we're doing a lot of work with those folks to to make sure that we're working always to to close the gender gap in terms of cyber career opportunities. We want to make sure that um, all students have an awareness of these opportunities that exist in cyber, and we're doing that through these kinds of outreach with curriculum, professional development, and our webinar series as we've been talking uh, these last couple of months. Uh, so for more information on all of that, take a look at our YouTube channel uh, and everything is available through the cyber.org webpage. Um, one last resource we make available to teachers and, and counselors and administrators is something we call our pro career profile cards. We want all students to know about these great opportunities that exist, what kind of salaries they pay, what kind of uh, education they need to get there, what kind of job growth is expected. And we do that through these career profile cards. We've got 20 different careers that are profiled um, in this way through our website, um, cyber.org. Uh, slash career profiles and, and you can take a I'm sorry career exploration and you can take a look at all those career profile cards. They make great posters. They make great do now slides uh, for teachers in the classroom. You want to put this up as students are coming into your classroom. A great opportunity to engage them in thinking about some of these different uh, career opportunities. And with that, uh, I'm going to hand it over to my friend, Dr. Brianna Blazer from the University of Washington, who is the counselor and coordinator for the Do It Center, which stands for Disabilities, Opportunities, Internetworking and Technology. Dr. Blazer, it's a pleasure to have you here. Uh, by all means, spend the next couple of minutes to tell us about what's happening at the University of Washington. Yeah, awesome. Thank you so much for inviting me here and giving me the opportunity to talk a little bit about the work we do. So um, I work for a center at the University of Washington and most of the work that I do is on National Science Foundation funded grants related to computer science education for students with disabilities. Um, so I'm gonna talk about that a little bit today and um, we have a lot of resources. I might be referring to some of them. Um, you can find them on our website at uw.edu slash access computing. Um, and feel free to shoot me an email. There's my email address, blazer, B-L-A-S-E-R at uw.edu. We can go to the next slide. So 
the two main projects that we work on, one is called Access Computing, and this is an NSF uh, national alliance um, that works to increase the participation of people with disabilities in computing education and careers. So we work both through um, direct interventions with students with disabilities. So we have a, a team of about 500 students with disabilities in um, post-secondary education and graduate school, some in high school who are intending to major in um, computer science when they get to college and they have a variety of disabilities. So we do mentoring and career development um, with those students. We send them to conferences, we get them research opportunities um, and do a lot of just one-on-one -on -one support, right? So I was emailing with a student the other day about um, job interviews and the accommodations she was gonna need in job and interviews and how to negotiate that process. Um, so that's part of the work that we do there. The other part is thinking about institutional transformation. Um, and, and through this, we have about 70 partners we work with nationwide. Um, they're computing organizations like the Computing Research Association, um, anitab.org, but also academic departments at universities um, to think about the work that they are doing to be welcoming and inclusive of people with disabilities. Um, so part of this is just making sure as we're having conversations about broadening participation in computing, that disability is included as a substantive part of that conversation. Um, and I say that as somebody who, until I did this work myself in disability, knew very little, right? So my, um, my PhD is in women's studies. My research was all on studying women in science and engineering. Um, and I knew very much, oh yeah, disability is underrepresented. But if I could, I couldn't really tell you more than that by the time I finished my PhD, because I think a lot of times when we're having these conversations about science and engineering uh, workforce issues and broadening participation, we're not really moving much beyond talking about race and gender, you know, even if we mention some of these other groups. And so um, a lot of the work we do is trying to be the squeaky wheel in conversations um, about broadening participation in computing. Um, so this week actually is the um, Association of Computing Machinery, ACM's SIGC, the Special Interest Group on Computer Science Education meeting. So we have been there this week uh, and, and being offering sessions to talk about disability, but also showing up in other places and just kind of asking like, okay, so you talked about this, what about disability and, and having those conversations. Um, so that's part of what we do. Um, the other project is probably more relevant um, to, to some of the things we're talking about here, which is really focused on K-12 computing education. Uh, and we first started working in this space about six years ago now, um, as there was more and more push to get um, students in K-12 education into computer science classes, um, and really trying to make sure that students with disabilities aren't left out of that um, transition as we increase you know, the, the opportunities available to K-12 students in computer science. Um, so part of the work we do there is partnering um, with uh, uh, some folks down in uh, Las Vegas, University of Nevada, Las Vegas, to develop accessible tools and curricula. Um, some of it is doing professional development for teachers of students with disabilities. So um, in the past couple summers, we've run professional development workshops to train teachers at schools for the deaf and schools for the blind to teach an accessible version of AP Computer Science Principles, the most recent AP course um, that came out about five years ago now. Um, and that we've been working this year, we were gonna do it last summer, but then our plans fell apart to work with teachers that serve, um, that are at schools that serve students with learning disabilities and who are neurodiverse. Um, and we didn't do it last summer. We're gonna do it this summer, it'll be online. We were hoping, you know, a year ago, none of us quite knew what things were gonna look like summer 2021. Um, so we do a lot of that. And then the other thing that we do through both of these programs um, is provide individualized support for folks. So folks call us up all the time and say, hey, do you know of a curriculum that's accessible and can work for this student? Or do you know of blah, 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 you know, or I'm running into this barrier. And sometimes we can't answer the question, but we can refer you to other folks that can. Um, so can we go to the next slide? Um, so when, we, when I was talking to Chuck about this, um, I was thinking about some of the things that are kind of most pressing to me in terms of accessibility and computer science education. And, and this issue of accessible tools and curricula is one that comes up all the time. Um, so a lot of the existing tools are just not accessible, right? So either they can't be used by somebody that's using a screen reader um, or they can't be used by somebody that can't use a mouse. Um, so all these great tools that you see all over the place, Scratch is, is one that's great, people love it, but again, it's not accessible. Um, and so this is a big problem. Um, even until um, uh, we developed 
an accessible version of AP computer science principles, there was no accessible version that any student across the country could take because they all relied on these tools that aren't accessible. So there's all this great work being done in K-12 education and all these great tools being developed, but there's this problem. Um, so we um, are doing a few things. One is we partner with uh, Andrea Stefik, who's at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, and developed the quorum programming language uh, that is born accessible. Um, and uh, he is quite dedicated to making sure everything runs smoothly there. It can be used by sighted and non-sighted folks. He's got all kinds of cool things in there, game engines, and um, uh, it's a great, it's a great uh, programming language. He also has a free professional development course that runs every summer called EPIC, E-P-I-Q. Um, so that's one great resource. Um, but through this work, we're also finding other folks that have accessible tools and trying to make sure that folks know about them. So we have a variety of webinars on our site hosted by folks that have other accessible tools. Um, so the Bootstrap programming language is another example. They were not accessible, but we started working with them and they got, they heard they drank the Kool-Aid, I don't know, for lack of a better phrase, uh, but got on board and made it accessible. Swift Playgrounds from Apple is another great group that's got some accessible tools. Um, but we often get questions about folks that are looking for curricula and tools at the elementary and middle school level, and there's just not as much at that, at that level because a lot of these tools just aren't accessible. Um, there's some things, but they may not be a full curricula. And so that's really, we'd, we really want to move into the middle school level ourselves, but haven't gotten the funding to do that yet. So hopefully down the road, that will be something we work on. Um, can I go to the next slide, please? Um, so as, as I mentioned, we've been doing these professional development workshops over the past couple of years and working closely with um, teachers from schools for the deaf and schools for the blind and trying to learn from them. Um, about what they're encountering, the changes that need to be made to curricula to make them accessible, but also trying to remember that the large majority of students with disabilities are in general education classrooms, right? So they're not in the schools for the deaf or the schools for the blind necessarily. So how do we make sure that that teacher that has one blind student in their classroom is able to serve that student as well as the other students that are in, in their class? So again, um, if we're talking about blind students, accessible tools are, um, are are critical, right? If it's not an accessible tool, the student can't program. Uh, you know, and particularly, I think the thing that we run into a lot is just these totally visual outputs that are not particularly meaningful um, uh, to blind students, right? Um, so that is one thing that we heard. So uh, as I mentioned, we had worked to develop an accessible version of the AP computer science principles curriculum. So we know folk, we know teachers in mainstream schools, general education classrooms that have had one blind student and said, well, I'm going to have the blind student use the quorum version and everybody else will use the code.org version, which they're written in parallel so that that can be done. Um, and we also know folks in general education classrooms that have just said, well, we'll just use the quorum version for everybody. It works for everybody. I don't, I don't need to do a one-off for this one student, right? Um, and really the, the feedback with, that we have gotten um, working with these teachers that work with uh, students who are blind is just to work closely with any TVIs that the students are working with. So teachers of the visually impaired and, and work closely together to make sure that those students are served. Um, again, we also did a similar professional development with teachers that work with students who are deaf. And some of our lessons learned for that are folks remembering that um, interpreting and captioning are imperfect to expect there to be misunderstandings. You know, even um, one of my colleagues um, is a CODA, his, his parents were deaf and so he signs a lot. And he talks a lot about how there might be a sign for tree that means like a tree outside, I'm pointing out my window, there's a big tree out there. But that's very different than the sign that you might use in programming for tree. And so kind of understanding how students are gonna figure out what those signs are and, and that there are gonna be uh, misunderstandings is important. Uh, and even in terms of captioning, I love to turn the captions on um, when I'm somewhere where an event is captioned so that I understand what it might, what people see if that's what they're really relying on. Um, so auto captions have gotten a lot better. I don't know if y'all have ever turned them on on Zoom as they've slowly been rolling uh, auto captioning out to the paid accounts. Um, it's not bad, but there's still imperfections, particularly talking about names or I know I tend to talk fast and it does not catch 
things when you talk particularly fast. So if you've never turned that on, I think it's a great experience to just turn it on and see what it's like. YouTube does auto captioning as well. Um, turn that on, see what it looks like. Um, uh, also, if you've got a student who's deaf in your classroom, there's a need to remember that that student needs to be close to their teacher, to the interpreter, to the captions, to the slides, because they are constantly turning and looking from one thing to the other. And so if they have to look from one side of the classroom to the other, that can be particularly difficult. Um, you know, even uh, this last year, I was part of a presentation where a student who's deaf was presenting about what her setup uh, or how she communicates and participates in classes. And she showed her setup of how many different screens and windows she has open so that as she's working remotely, going to classes remotely, she can have her interpreter up in one window, a presentation up in another window, another place where she's taking notes um, and, and manage that. Um, the other thing that, again, teachers who are teaching in a general education classroom might not be aware of if they're working with students who are deaf, um, is that they might need additional time right, because of differences in things like reading speed and comprehension, right? So a lot of deaf students wouldn't consider English to be their first language. And so some of the jargon and language there can take them um, some additional time. Okay, and we can go to the next slide. And then the other question, this is something we've really been talking about a lot in the last year is just how little data exists on whether students with disabilities are taking computer science, whether they are there or not. And so we've been, um, really talking a lot about, um, are we even collecting data on this? And, and largely we know, no, there's not a lot of data being collected on whether um, students with disabilities are out there. So a lot of times you'll find folks, like if you look at the uh, college board, they report the percentage of, of um, underrepresented minorities and women that are taking their computer science uh, courses and taking the exams, they do not report that information for students with disabilities. Um, you can look at a lot of other places that again are including demographic information, but not necessarily reporting again on students with disabilities. Um, and we see this really across, um, you know, not just K-12 education, but also beyond. When we've worked with the university partners, it's very hard to get information about whether students with disabilities are in computing majors at schools. Um, and so we were really encouraging folks to think about this is a, a means to, to really look at whether students are there um, and whether we're successful or not. So um, uh, code.org and the Expanding Computing Education Pathways put out this annual state of computer science report. Um, and for years, it didn't have information on disability. And so they're friends of ours. And we would often say, hey, <laughs> be really great to have data on disability in there. And so last year for the first time there was data on disability. And as a matter of fact, when they put that in there, they also put some things like the percentage of students um, that were on free and reduced lunch. Um, and there were some other, other things too. It just, again, diversifying what we're looking at to make our a more nuanced understanding of what diversity means in this context. Um, and the other thing I would point out too is, um, this is something we saw in Washington State, uh, a, a colleague of ours is really active um, with the st state legislature and the laws and policies um, around computer science education as it's rolled out across the state here. And so somewhere in there, there is, uh, you know, a line that says that they have to collect data on the students who are participating in computer science education. So um, just making sure that that says, you know, you're collecting race, gender, uh, are you also collecting disability data, right? And at the K-12 level, looking at the students who have 504 plans or IEPs can be an easy way um, to find that. So um, I think that's my last slide, but that's kind of an overview. Oh, oh no, I did put yep. one more thing in there. Uh, that's kind of an overview of some of the work we're doing. We have some upcoming webinars um, that have been funded by the Infosys Foundation. Again, to talk more about some of the lessons learned, they're presented by teachers that work with various students with disabilities designed to help general education uh, classroom teachers learn some strategies they can use with their students. So if you go to our website and scroll down, there's a there's a little news article in the bottom right corner and you can find the link to register for those. Um, so we'd love to have more folks join us. Excellent. Uh, really great information. I, I thank you for sharing that. Um, I see, you know, as we get questions in the chat uh, for, for questions that are, I think are relevant for all of us, uh, the panelists, I'll hold to the end. So um, Sylvia, I see your question there. I'm gonna just table it for just a second, but I do have a question for you, Dr. Blazer, if you don't mind. Um, I wanted to address something you mentioned about um, you know, students, um, we're expecting misunderstandings. And, and do you find that the students that you're encountering or the teachers that have these students in the classroom, that their understanding of the fact that 
there are going to be misunderstandings and that we need to expect them and, and they, they work through them. I mean, are, are students re resentful at the fact that, you know, they, there are going to be misunderstandings and it's going to require re-explanation for them or, you know, how, what's your impression of the, the student's perspective on that? You know, I think the students aren't resentful of that. I think they know that that's there. And if a teacher has an extra check to make sure like, hey, are we all on the same page? That goes a long way to just not leaving those students confused, right? Sitting there confused. And, and I think some of those comments too about expecting misunderstandings are gonna be true for multiple populations, right? Um, like I said, we're just starting to work more with, with teachers that are working with students with learning disabilities and autism. But from some of the teachers I've talked to there, I expect, expect to, that will have some similar findings um, okay. from working with that population. Uh, one more question before I move on was on, on um, uh, accommodations. You mentioned um, born accessible. Did I miss, mishear you? What's, what's, you said something early on. About oh, that. yeah. So we talk about something being born accessible in terms of a piece of technology. In other words, it was created accessible from the start, um, which, you know, designed with accessibility in mind rather than something that has to be retrofitted after it's already designed. Yeah. And, and generally that is cheaper and easier than going back and making something accessible that wasn't accessible from the get go. Yeah. And, and last thing you mentioned interpreter in a window. So this student who had multiple windows open, uh, when you talk about an interpreter, is that someone, someone live in person who's signing the lesson that's happening in the background? Yeah, yeah. And so, and actually, you know, it's gotten so much better over the last year to do these things remotely as some of the conferencing tools, particularly Zoom, have rolled out new functionality. But when the student spoke at that time, she had to have multiple Zoom windows open and computers didn't like having multiple Zoom windows open. So, um, you know, it was, uh, it's gotten a lot better just in the last year, which is great, right? Yeah, perfect. That's wonderful news. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to uh, switch over to my, my, my other good friend, uh, Tish Harris, uh, and ask what's happening at Virginia's DBVI. She's the pre and Career Pathways Coordinator. Uh, and Tish, if you're ready, um, let's okay. take a look. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me today. So I was lucky enough five years ago to um, begin work on a grant that was given to Virginia for Career Pathways. And as we took a look at that grant, we were one, Virginia was one of four states. The others were Nebraska, Kentucky, and Georgia. As we took a look at career pathways, we started to look at the challenges and look at where we were, where we wanted to go, and what could we do that was innovative and kind of, you know, break out of the shell that we were in. So we took a look at STEM knowing that we really wanted to promote STEM with DBVI. And as we started to take a look at it, we realized that our students were hesitant to join CTE programs. In fact, Dr. Gardner was in the audience one time when I asked a group of 21 students who had just built their bot and coded it how many of you all have taken CTE classes at your schools? And I think four hands went up and I was shocked. So I made it, of course, my business to get in their business and go around and ask, why? So I heard a number of things. One is that our students were hesitant. They had a lack of confidence. But you were just talking about misunderstandings. I would also add misperceptions. Because the other reason a lot of them were not in CTE were that they were told, oh, you really need a study hall so that you don't get behind. And I'm thinking, these are straight A students. Or they were told, you need more time with your TVI. And in a few cases, they were told that you're not a good fit for this CTE program. So Commissioner Hopkins, <laughs> Call me into his office and says, okay, we are going to have a mindset change. <laughs> Let's show that our students can excel or even outperform students at a public school level. Um, there's summer camps going on here. I want to find that curriculum. I want to adapt it. I want to make it accessible and I'm going to get out of the way. So you take this on. <laughs> And of course, he reminded me of his saying, never fall into the tyranny of low expectations. 
So let's move to the next slide. I was really feeling the heat, I have to tell you. So our answer was, we're gonna build it, we're gonna create opportunities. Virginia Department of Education had had a series of summer camps. And I am on a career pathways group in the Shenandoah Valley. As I was talking about looking for this curriculum, hmm, I found an expert up to the challenge. That was Dr. Gardner. And uh, we talked to him about, we want to create this hands-on opportunity because we know that that is a way our students will really learn and retain. You know, a lot of our students just hearing it, that isn't going to do it. So it had to be hands-on. We wanted uh, in-demand pathways or STEM pathways. And we wanted to include a residential program because the other side of that confidence for us was giving people um, that independent experience to become a time manager, to become a team player, a good communicator. So we incorporated those. We wanted our students to leave with confidence and knowledge and a tangible take home. And the reason I underlined that is I always had waiting lists for my academies because one of the things I wanted to do is let them know that the work doesn't stop when the academy ends. You're going to take your bot home and the computer, the laptop that we bought you to learn to code that computer. We want you to continue work. So let's go on to the next one. <laughs> so I have to tell you, DBVI found our perfect partner. <laughs> um, Cyber.org was already working with Virginia Department of Ed. Um, Dr. Gardner, when I first called him, said, hmm, let, let's think about that. They came to Richmond. They decided they're up for the challenge. And our end result or is the, our, our minds blown. Our parents, our students, the expectations have changed and the bar has now been set much higher. So Dr. Gardner, what do you think your biggest takeaway from your three years of Robotics Academy were? I, I think the biggest takeaway was that first call, right? That, that there was the need to, to challenge your students, right? Your population with the, the materials that their peers were getting in, in, let's call it the mainstream classroom, right? That that 2016 Cyber Summer Camp went to 32 high schools across the state, 200 educators, 700 students were impacted by these camps. And this, this whole population wasn't even considered. Um, and, and, you know, Commissioner Hopkins with the challenge of, of putting, pitting these kids side by side with their, with their peers, um, let's, let's hold them up to it and they, they, can, they can rise to that challenge. You know, I mean, there, there are people that you're gonna encounter every day that are gonna say that's never gonna happen. Um, and it was, it was the biggest opportunity for, for us, right? For my team to come in and meet you, meet your team and, and really begin to comprehend the capabilities and the, the fact that we were gonna not only get through this, but we were gonna succeed. And no more evident was that on, than on day one, right? When we showed up with a, our agenda, Josh was with me, Josh is in the audience here. So Josh was with me on day one. We showed up with, with boxes of bots. So it's not a bot, right? It's a box of parts. It's going to be a bot. And we had budgeted all day for this thing to become, right? That, that painstaking process of building the bot. We have teachers at workshops who take five, six hours to build their bots. So we had planned on five, six hours um, for your students to build the bot. And I mean, totally under uh, underappreciated their capabilities because two hours, the bots were done. And we were starting to start, we were programming day one. We weren't planning on programming day one, but we were ready to go. And, and the rest, right, the next, that year, the next two years, equally impressive, um, uh, you know, surpassing of expectations um, by all the students oh, every day. They're there early, they're working late. Uh, they didn't want to go to the pre-ETS activities because they were they were busy coding and learning science. Right? We're talking about the physics. We're talking about the math. How do these devices work? And we're programming. We're building in intricate circuits, and they just embraced every opportunity to do it. And those are you know, it's just great summer experiences working with your your team and, and your students. Okay. I remember at the end of the first one, we had talked, and I said, "Well, you know, we we really need to talk." we're thinking about doing this again. And we were wondering, and you said, oh, that's it, I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> no, 
No convincing needed. <laughs> so one of the things that we really did early on is we were very deliberate about adding in, um, of course, the accessible curriculum, which Dr. Gardner did, but also a lot of supports because we wanted to make sure our students had everything they needed. So we add elements of universal design, um, which, you know, that sounds really fancy, but it, for us, it was muffin tins and ice cube trays. And the picture on the bottom right shows an ice cube, uh, shows a muffin tin. Some students like the ice cube trays because they were um, smaller. And as the students would unpack their box with all those screws, they would simply put them in the muffin tin or the ice cube trays. And, and not only that, right, it became it became an organizational tool. We turned it into coordinates. We would number them and, and they would go back and, and find those exact coordinates where they left these components. Um, and it, it was just it was a it was a, a game day decision, right, that that became a, a central focus of really this opportunity. Absolutely. And we also tried to provide some things. We had an assistive technology expert. Um, that we borrowed from WWRC and Mr. Hall there. And we had this toolbox with us and we used everything from the simple, like sugar-free gum. We went through, I can't tell you how many um, packages of those because as you have a student who's getting sleepy, they can't sleep when their jaw's doing this. <laughs> So we used a lot of sugar-free gum, we used sleeves, we used fidgets, and then we also had more complex things like eye gaze, cart, sensory kits. And the picture on the bottom left shows one of our students, and she actually has the sleeves that athletes wear when they're you know, running or working out. And because they fit on her arms, that was the sensory input that she needed, and she flew right through this curriculum. Yep, and, and she's got a fidget in front of her, and it was just those tactile things. The robot became that tactile event, but for day one, day two, as we're assembling things, right, they, they there might be too many senses, and, and we just have to calm, they have to calm down. Uh, the other thing was, um, you know, you mentioned allowing the students to excel. Uh, another opportunity with this residential camp was you're bringing in technology that they may not have seen in their classrooms or at their schools just to show them what some of these other tools that were available to them uh, that they may not have considered. I thought that was extremely um, inventive also. Oh, we had a lot of new things. <laughs> so this is just to show you how kind of how we evolved in 2017. We started with Robotics and Cyber Academy. 2018, we continued that, but we also added curriculum from cyber.org for cyber, cyber analyst is what we called it, and coding. Um, again, in 2019, we repeated all three of those things, but we had staff trained to present the cyber analyst and the coding. And then in 2020, we were all ready to jump into our new program, Leap into Linux, and then COVID delayed us. Um, we did do some um, repositioning. We presented a virtual one-week Cyber Warrior Academy um, with one of our partners, Intellectual Point, but happy to say in 2021, we are going to do Leap into Linux with a smaller cohort the last week of June. So let's go on to the next one. So I just wanted to share with you um, the counselor information that I gave and just call your attention to two things. One is on the eligibility. I try to tell our counselor who's a good fit for this academy. We use seventh and eighth grade reading and math levels. So middle school, basic IT skills did not have to be someone with experience. And on the left side, I really stress that not only are the students gonna learn these skills with the bot and the coding, but they're also gonna learn those soft skills that employers want and we know they need. Yeah, and, and I'll, I'll say with the eligibility, one of the things that comes up a lot in our conversations is, right, who, who should be taking these kinds of experiences? And, and when we talk about this, this camp opportunity with DBVI, it was always, 
we're not just building the bot for the sake of building the bot, right? We're going to install an ultrasonic distance sensor. Well, how does it work? Let's study the physics of the speed of sound and this travel, how sound travels through air, because that's what this sensor is doing. So the students are going to go away knowing more about the bot, right? Then, then it's just a, a, a a box under a Christmas tree, right, for example. So um, we are going to go into the science, we are going to go into the math, and we're going to have these discussions throughout the, the course of the week. So um, we wanted to make sure there was some academic value to this as well. Yeah, our commissioner was shocked. He came to visit the classroom and he said to me, Tish, are they figuring out the speed of sound? And I'm like, yes. Yep. <laughs> He's like, okay, I'm going back to my office now. <laughs> so, um, Leap into Linux was our new program, and I just put some things on the slide so you can see the difference with Leap into Linux. And the reason we were so excited is we weren't using curriculum that was already designed. Dr. Gardner is designing this curriculum, and, and you heard Dr. Glazer talk about curriculum that's accessible from the beginning. So this is curriculum for Leap into Linux. We're, you know, Yep. Also going to add, you now my challenge will be some of those outside activities, but this is what we're doing in June. With the bots, we were programming in BASIC, which is kind of an outdated programming language. So we wanted something a little fresher, a little more relevant. Um, we found a, a, a VI of a, a um, VI, is that the expression, Tish? Um, mm -hmm. A VI, in a, 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 a VI version of, of Linux called Vinix. So we're going to do some programming and learn how, how Linux works because that's a key component to uh, cybersecurity and, and how data flows on the internet. So um, it's going to be an exciting opportunity. So one of the other key pieces is that we did work with business. We had people from Capital One come in at lunch every day and talk to all of our students. Our students had the opportunity to do an informational interview and this was kind of some of our soft skills teaching because we had to teach sometimes students how to ask questions. The most frequently asked questions, of course, how much money do you make always? And, and Dr. Gardner is laughing. What tasks and skills are needed? What education do you need? Um, how did they get started with tech? And in this picture is a gentleman named Jed. And when he came to talk to our students, he had on a t-shirt and jeans. And one of the students <clears throat> who didn't get the memo about being, you know, super polite said, do you really wear a shirt and jeans to work? And he said, yep, yeah, they let me wear anything I want because I solve problems no one else can solve. That was the take home. That and their eyes when they find out <laughs> that some of them made $100,000 or more. That was the other. So we can move forward. So I do want to tell you what our outcomes were because you heard a lot about how it worked. Um, we had Robotics Academies 2017, 18, and 19. So overall, 59 of the 63 students we have have either entered or plan to enter a career pathway through two or four year college credential training, or by going directly into employment. That's a 94% success rate. With DBVI, 37 of 38 students have entered or plan to enter a career pathway. Our commissioner's happy, that's 97.3%. So I have tracked these students to see what they're doing. Remember that some of them, for example, in 2018, they were a freshman in high school. So I'm looking to see what their goals are. A combined three-year breakdown, um, 11 of the students are still in school, 20 are currently in high school, 20 are currently in college, 22, uh, I'm sorry, still in school, um, would be, could be, for example, at WWRC, they could be in a career technical school, 20 are in college, 22 are college bound, 11 are doing credential training for a career, and seven are doing full-time employment. And you'll see kind of a mix. Some students fell into more than one category. So questions I can answer, or if you want to hold them till the end. There are some great questions coming in and, and I do want to table them because I want to make sure we get our, at least our speakers within the hour. And then uh, for anyone who can hang out, we'll answer some questions. Uh, so I, I appreciate um, appreciate y'all standing by and, and again, fill that chat with questions. So. Um, 
Thank you, Tish. Excellent information. Again, a continued wonderful partnership. So I'm looking forward to summer of 21. Um, and with that, uh, I'm going to um, bring uh, introduce my my last friend uh, today. My not my last friend, not like I have three friends, but my third friend today, uh, Mr. James Hall, who is the manager uh, for Career and Workforce Development Division, a division uh, in IT at the Wilson Workforce uh, and Rehabilitation Center, otherwise known as WWRC. Um, James, pleasure, welcome, and uh, go ahead and share what's happening at WWRC. Great. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for allowing me to come and. I have a lot of friends and everyone on this call, and I think we have some great partners with cyber.org in addition to DBVI, and I wanted to kind of follow up with what Tish stated and just the agencies. So I work for the Department for Aging and Rehabilitative Services. So we are a sister agency for the DBVI. We help individuals with disabilities create personal independence through employment. And so look, think of us as the community college for DARS. And so what Tish, great job of the academies, even having it at WWRC. We had the robotics in Richmond. We also had a manufacturing academy, and I'm going to give her credit for that she helped out with CPID. And so a lot of those students in the academies were looking, as she stated, additionally, what's a pathway? Uh, where's the credential? Where can we go for further education? Well, WWRC is one of those places where we can go for further education. Our programs, specifically in IT, is around 11 months. Our IT instructor, Matt Hooven, is unfortunately not able to make it today. He's out for medical leave, but it's okay. Uh, we're here because we have to look at now, how do we add both the hands-on piece, as Tish was stating, which is very, very important, but we also have a small academic piece. And because the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act requires an industry-recognized credential, we try to have a balance of the hands-on and the academic. So it really made us look at how do we redesign our curriculum using technology to not only make it accessible, but also to have specific outcomes that are positive for the students. So one model I wanted to show everyone, and it's kind of my background. I, I've been a K through 12 special education teacher, in addition K through 12 administrator at the high school, middle school level. So I feel I'm talking to uh, the choir in a good way. And this model has been around for, for a while, but I found that is so, just so perfect on knowing where to start. How do we incorporate technology into our curriculum? And it's called the SAMR model, the substitution, augmentation, modification, redesign. So similar to reading, you would start from the left and go to the right. So whenever we're looking at how do we bring technology in our curriculum together to make it accessible, if you go to the very left, I'm not gonna read everything word for word, but just to hit some of the highlights, you always start with the substitution. And we're gonna use Starbucks. Uh, who doesn't like coffee uh, from that end? Starbucks, uh, a nod to our Dr. Blazer in Seattle. And so we can make coffee at home or we can go to Starbucks to get coffee. That would be the substitution model where technology acts as a direct substitute, but not a lot of functional change. Well, let's say we wanna enhance it and really augment. Well, let's say you go to Starbucks, you get a latte. Well, this is where technology not only acts as a direct substitute, but also helps with functional improvement. So we've added a little of the froth, a little of the cream. Well, as we're going down the road, we're going, well, technology can do even more. Well, let's look at the next level and modification. This is where technology allows for a significant, really task redesign. So that's the caramel macchiato. You're adding the caramel at top which starts all the way back at the substitution principle. So they're building on top of each other. And then the last model that we use is redesign. Technology allows for the creation of completely new tasks. This could be project-based learning. Um, this could be analyzed, synthesized, making something. And that's where Starbucks came out with the pumpkin spice. And so we always start at the yes level, substitution, and we see, well, maybe we can go to the modification redesign level sooner or faster, just depending on where we are in the curriculum. So we'll start out with that basic. Enough about me talking. Uh, Dr. Gardner, if you want to go to the next slide. I wanted to show a quick video. And this is, it may be an academic English social studies, but it has another aspect of SAMR that probably can explain it better than I can. So feel free to okay. be able to watch it.
Every day, teachers are designing activities to target higher order thinking skills in order to engage students in rich learning experiences. But integrating technology adds a whole new layer to teaching and learning. How can technology transform your learning design? Dr. Ruben Puentadura developed the SAMR model as a way for teachers to evaluate how they are incorporating technology into their instructional practice. You can use SAMR to reflect upon how you are integrating technology into your classroom. Is it an act of substitution, augmentation, modification, or redefinition? Dr. Puentadura likens his model to moving up a ladder. The model includes a dotted line that represents the threshold where you shift from using technology to enhance learning to using it to transform learning. Transforming learning promotes higher order thinking skills, such as analyzing, evaluating, and creating, which are essential to Common Core State Standards and 21st century learning. So, how can you teach above the line? Let's take a look at an example of a classroom task and how it evolves through the lens of SAMR. In substitution, technology acts as a direct tool substitute with no real functional change to the task. For example, take creative writing. What if you had students write a story using a word processing program? In this case, students are substituting a handwritten story for a typed story. The task is the same with no real change in student engagement. In augmentation, technology still substitutes, but with some functional improvement. What if you took the same creative writing assignment and had students use a word processing program? They could use features such as spell check and tools for formatting. Again, the story writing task is the same, but the technology augments it with enhanced productivity. In modification, technology should allow for significant task redesign. Take the same creative writing assignment and have students use Google Docs to write their stories. Students can then share these stories with peers and provide real-time feedback. Here, technology has significantly modified the original task by introducing the benefits of student collaboration. At the top stage, redefinition, technology allows for the creation of entirely new tasks that were previously inconceivable. What if students transform their written stories into multimedia productions? After creating storyboards, students film scenes, edit clips, and add music. They can publish the videos and receive feedback from voices across the globe. In this case, technology redefines the story writing task to include media creation, critical thinking, collaboration, and communication. So, how can you use SAMR to reflect upon transforming your learning design? Puentadura offers reflection questions to help you move up the SAMR ladder and shift how you are designing learning experiences. For instance, ask yourself, what will I gain by replacing the older technology with the new technology? Have I added an improvement to the task process that could not be accomplished with the older technology at a fundamental level? Does this modification fundamentally depend upon the new technology? How is the new task uniquely made possible by the new technology? These are just a few of the questions you can ask yourself as you evaluate the design of a classroom task and consider that not all technology integration is created equal. Ultimately, SAMR can help you evaluate your use of technology and design tasks that target higher order thinking skills, engage students in rich learning experiences, and impact student achievement. Excellent. Great, next slide, please. In addition, and this is where I get really excited, kind of the educational theory, because again, you saw the SAMR model. What is great is it's also aligned with Bloom's taxonomy. And so when they're talking about teaching above the line, well, the line goes right across over to Bloom. So let's just use the bottom aspect, the bottom right substitution, as you saw as the first step. Well, on Bloom's taxonomy, the crosswalk goes over to knowledge. You're just basically repeating or substituting. Well, as you're moving really up the ladder on this one for SAMR, augmentation, that will help you work with comprehension and application, your understanding and then applying. The above the line that they were talking about in the video, the modification redesign, as you're coming across the left with Bloom's taxonomy, that's the critical higher order thinking skills, analysis, synthesis, evaluation, similar to what Tish stated earlier. It wasn't just a box under a tree, but how did they really expand on that in terms of learning about 
the speed of light, the whole aspect of it. So we're really trying to make sure that we're developing the critical thinking skills that they'll need once they get on the job. How do you problem solve? So this is Bloom's and Sammer's crosswalk. Want to hit one more slide, please? Well, then sometimes you have all these great ideas, but you're going, wow, there's so much out there. How, how do I know what to use? Well, we found, and we cheat a little bit. Uh, we go out and use the resources available and cyber.org definitely does have a lot of stuff. In addition, they have it accessible. But I found that just a, an ability to know even where to start. Let's say I wanna have a presentation. Well, we all have at the substitution model, Microsoft PowerPoint. Well, if I wanna start teaching by the line in augmentation, I can use Prezi. If I wanna to go to modification, MindMeister. If I wanna go down to redefinition, redesign, Nearpod. And I'm going, oh, okay, now I know where to go. The key is making sure they're accessible. And so we have an IT and AT specialist, Tim Bobson, who makes sure that some of these are accessible. If they're not accessible, of course we can't use them, but we try to make sure that they're universal design for learning. And all of these um, <laughs> are great and amazing. And we have some who are better than others working with them, but this has been a big, big, tremendous help for us. Dr. Gardner, if you wanna hit one more. In addition, in the world of special education, so again, our mission is to help individuals with disabilities create personal independence through employment, and that's also with Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act with their board certified credentials, in addition to access. We're definitely about access, but now we have to look at outcomes because it's what's best for students. And so I'm getting a little legalistic, but this is how the world of special ed has changed just in the last couple of years. In 2017, there was a US Supreme Court case called Andrew F versus Douglas County. And it really goes beyond access because what it required is that special education offer more than de minimis or basically the minimum. So you have to make appropriate progress in light of the children's circumstances. So let's not be happy getting them there. Now let's go win the whole thing. And really it's special education is not a location, it's a service. Expectation is now to make appropriate progress. And this just came out roughly two years ago in current trends and legal issues in special ed. So at the K through 12 level, you guys are gonna start seeing that a little more, not only access, but also outcomes. And so that's how we look at it in terms of the state operated programs as Virginia Department of Education. In addition, Department for Aging and Rehabilitative Services, we are bilingual and bicultural. Also working with our sister agencies, DBVI, cyber.org, it takes a whole village. So if you wanna go fast, go by yourself, but if you wanna go farther, go as a group. That's all I have. That's great content, James, thank you very much. Um, we're just going to do a couple of administrative things and then I'm going to get back to questions. I want to make sure for those who can only stay with us through the top of the hour um, that we, we finish the content and then we're going to go back and answer some questions. So I just want to let you all know um, the cyber.org webinar series next month uh, with the focus of April being the month of the military child. We're going to be talking about how to reach military connected students through purposeful cyber education outreach and that's scheduled to happen Thursday, April 22nd from 2 to 3 p.m. Central Daylight Now time. Uh, and the last thing I want to mention is coming up this summer for all of our um, uh, educator friends in the audience, our Cyber Education Discovery Forum. This is our annual um, big conference where we uh, invite teachers from our national audience to converge for three days of uh, learning and, and networking. So this, uh, this year it's going to happen from June 21 through June 23rd. It's going to be virtual through our CVENT platform. And you can get some more information on that at cyber.org slash CEDF. Uh, we're gonna focus on five workshop tracks that includes content for elementary, middle school, and high school. Uh, we're gonna have some interactive workshops during the mornings, uh, breakout and networking and birds of a feather sessions in the afternoons, keynotes from educational leaders, and it will all be presented um, virtually. So come on, come all, um, we'd love to um, include you uh, in this content. Um, Last slide is just going to put up some email addresses again if there was um, a question we don't get to in the next couple of minutes and you want to reach out separately by all means. Um, I want to thank uh, Dr. Blazer, uh, Ms. Harris and Mr. Hall for their time. And with that, 
uh, I'm going to get to some questions. So if you can hang out uh, and ask some answer, uh, and listen to us answer some questions or ask some more questions, by all means do so. Um, we've we've loved having you here this last hour, and here we go. So I'm going to scroll back up um, because there was a, a question early on uh, from our friend Sylvie um, Sylvie um, Ketchmarek, and uh, I think you're in uh, the West Coast also, Sylvie, if I'm not mistaken, right? So. Um, so we asked, do you consider some learning differences requiring accommodations as disabilities? And uh, I'll throw this to the crowd. Uh, I'm not sure um, who, who can answer this best, but anyone want to address the, the question, do you consider some learning differences requiring accommodations uh, as disabilities? And is there a, a definition we can talk about here that, that what is a, a disability requiring accommodations in the classroom? And if we can, we can yeah, take I I was just gonna say we use the word disability really loosely, you know, and, and to some extent follow the ADA of you know any alters any major life activity. So certainly if we're thinking about learning differences like dyslexia or if we're thinking about um, autism and that kind of stuff, definitely, yeah. Excellent. And at WWRC, we're willing to accommodate anyone that has learning differences, but if you use universal design for learning, we try to definitely level that playing field. Uh, in terms of by law, to have a disability, you'd have to have an IEP, which mm -hmm. uses accommodations. Well, if you had a 504, they would be considered strategies. And so, again, we can get the legalistic aspect of it, but we try to go, again, if you have the ADA, a Rehabilitation Act, IDEA, we're going to do what's best for students. Uh, we don't need necessarily that label, but we're going to use just the best accommodations and strategies we have to meet all students. Real quick follow up for the for the purpose of, of those in the audience. When you reference IEPs and 504s, those are traditionally K-12 um, references, right? That's not something that follows a student after graduation from high school? Okay. That is correct. Diana, I see you're unmuted. Do you have something? Yeah, I was going to say uh, where I work, um, my school is unique because we work with students from all over the United States, as well as students from overseas. Uh, the IEP thing uh, that you guys have just been bringing up, it does follow the student to college because if a student is applying to a school and they need to have some waivers and they need to have some accommodations, the IEP actually becomes a very critical piece of paperwork for them. Okay. To, to basically get those kinds of functions. That, okay. That's what we've encountered, that some colleges will ask the high school IEP of 504 to be able to implement some accommodation at the college level. Precisely. So what we, we make sure that our students are basically all brought up to date on their neuropsych evaluations uh, before, well before they graduate from high school, because we know that 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 one legal document is gonna maybe help turn the corner for some of them, get them some accommodations and think other things that they probably would not have gotten otherwise. Uh, I had one student who was able to use his IEP and a few other things to help get him a single room at Drexel. Kids you not. <laughs> um. So, so um, Diana, you also um, reached in with a with a, a comment. Was it? Uh, is that what we're addressing? You you wanted to mention Eagle Hill, you know, and your yeah. um, for students with disabilities. It's wonderful outreach. It's a it's a we've been tackling that term for. I've been working at this school for twenty years. I've been an educator a lot longer, but we use the word learning disabilities, learning differences. Um, we actually don't. We don't even. We do obviously observe it. Everybody that comes to school here has to have a, a, some kind of neuropsych evaluation or in an IEP. And we are dealing with students uh, from so many different school districts. I mean, I, if I just did my own study on school districts from across the United States, I, I cannot even begin to tell you. The kids coming from California have one set of things. The kids from New York have something else. Massachusetts, something else. 
and and I want to I want to make sure that uh, it doesn't appear that we're discounting any any other student no. population, right? By focusing on the work that Dr. Blazer and, and Ms. Harris and Mr. Hall are doing, okay. we right we recognize there are other um, you know students populations out there where we chose at, at this point to address um, blind vision impairments and and the camps that that are accessible to them. So um, you know there's a lot of other great work that's happening, and, and Diana, we we. Uh, are fortunate Thank to be able to see you as a friend in that in that space. So, um, question came in um, from uh, our, our another good friend, Alicia Kiermary, for Dr. Blazer. Um, her question was, "What's a good goal when looking at data about students with disabilities who take computer science? Um, should we be looking at the percentage of CS students who've reported disabilities? Uh, should we be looking at the percentage of population with reported disabilities? Do you have baseline data that would be ideal or that you're looking at?" So in general, I'd suggest looking at the population in that school or school district. And I'll say this in particular, because as we've started looking at data from different states, the percentages of students in different states that have um, IEPs or 504 plans varies dramatically, you know, and, and whether that's due to a different uh, number of folks being properly diagnosed in different parts of the country or what, I don't know exactly. I have hypotheses, but right. Um, but yeah, it, I wouldn't necessarily compared to the US population, but but rather the local students. That makes good sense. Thank you. Um, so uh, Sylvie's back with another question. And, and I think this is something that we can all uh, have a look at. So um, when we, we talk about right, the, the populations that we have experience with, um, the question is, have these students had the opportunity to participate in some competitions, whether it be robotics or cybersecurity? I see Tish smiling. I know we, we've, we've ready to hit on that answer. So I'll, I'll let you hit it first and then uh, see what the other thoughts are. Well, I've had several. Uh, I, we had one young man who came to us. He was a freshman in high school, loved what he was doing, went back home and to decided he was going to advocate for himself. He then ended up in governor's school and their group won a statewide competition in robotics. Um, and what's interesting, had he never met Dr. Gardner, would have never ended up there. And we've had several other students that went back to their schools and got involved in um, more school-wide or like district-wide competitions, but yes. Yeah, um, awesome stuff. And you know, it the, the essentially the camp is 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 almost like a competition, right? There's no there's no pressure to participate, but through the week of participating in these events, they're they're accomplishing many of the same tasks that their peers are are you know participating in with these uh, academic style competitions, whether it be robotics or, or cybersecurity themed. Um, uh, James, Dr. Blazer, any, any thoughts on students' abilities to, to compete uh, in some of these uh, engagements? And if it's not, it's fine. I know that um, the LEGO Robotics, you can use the core and programming language that I mentioned um, with LEGO Robotics, it's an accepted language. So I know at least in Maryland, there's a teacher that we've worked with um, that her students compete in the LEGO robot Robotics competitions. Mm -hmm. Since we're post-secondary, uh, we'd have to enter the Virginia Community College system. So what we do is each year we enter the credential showcase at the higher ed conference and we were able to win it for a manufacturing program. We also showcased our IT, so cybersecurity. We do quite well because we actually have the students there, which really makes it come alive that they're able to uh, do that work. So we consider that a win. Uh, but in terms of we don't, since we're the only WWRC in Virginia, um, we'd have to look outside, but we're willing to willing to travel. If you guys know of any competitions for post-secondary, we'll enter. Awesome. We're, we're not afraid. <laughs> awesome. Um, folks who are in the audience, any any more questions for us? Uh, we've gotten through just about uh, all of them. I know uh, Sylvie mentioned that some of the tricks that we learned at the, the DBVI camp uh, are definitely um, great opportunities for uh, organizational tools in, in the regular classroom. Um, you know, it, it, it remind, reminds me, Tish, of, the, of those comments we hear at these camps. You know, this is the first time I've used a screwdriver. Um, and, 
you know, that we, we have to, you know, assume that, that this, the students have, um, you know, a lot of these, um, you know, haven't had these opportunities to engage with these kinds of devices. We talk about resistors and the components and everything. And, and you know, it's just, we're, it's, it's just a great opportunity to, to see this learning happen at, a, at a, such an organic level. So, um, you know, just, it's been fabulous opportunities. Um, you know, Dr. Blazer, Mr. Hall, um, Tish, it's just you know really great work y'all are doing. Um, we're we're proud to, to call you all friends and, and to to you know share some of your good good work through this outlet. So, any closing thoughts? We're good. No, I'm looking forward to seeing you in June. I can't wait for our next evolution. Mm -hmm. And what I'm super excited about too is we have other states now who are reaching out to you. Dr. Gardner and I are gonna be presenting at the blind uh, pre-ETS community of practice to how many different states are on there, Dr. Gardner? Four or so. 30, 34? 24, okay. 30, yeah, it's a big list. So I'm really hoping that um, some of these states will really pick up these programs and, and provide these opportunities. I'm super excited about that. Always good to catch up. Um, ladies and gents, thanks for hanging out with us and uh, sharing thoughts on um, reaching all students.